Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox back for another episode. And today, I'm thrilled to have Travis Howerton with us. Travis, first of all, welcome and thank you so much for taking the time to visit with me today. Oh, thanks for having me. Appreciate the opportunity to be here. Travis, could you remind the audience what your professional background is and your current role? Sure thing. So I spent 20 plus years in the Department of Energy around the nuclear weapons program. Start, I started my career out in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, ended up becoming the chief technology officer of the U.S. nuclear weapons program. Then went out to Oak Ridge National Lab as the deputy director for the IT services division, then led the merger of Y-12 Pantex for Bechtel Corporation and Today, I serve as the Chief Technology Officer for uh, RegScale, where I lead the R&D division here in Knoxville, Tennessee, that's building out our software. Could you tell us a little bit about RegScale? Sure. So we're a continuous compliance automation or continuous controls monitoring platform. We think we're what comes next after governance, risk, and compliance, which had its run over the last 20 years. But we think increasingly, if you take a 20-year view or really 10 year view of where the world's going. Everything's going to be cloud-based, API driven and AI ML enabled. And so systems are become real time, ephemeral in nature. We just had this insight that continuing to try to document things in manual paper-based static processes and web forms just wasn't going to work for the future. So we went and built the world's first essentially headless GRC or compliance data lake where you could pull data from all your different sources, get them in one place, have self-updating paperwork, and be able to generate artifacts on demand for regulators, which we think is the future of where the industry needs to go. And it's an area Gartner and others um, are starting to write about in their market guides and what's on the horizon. So that's the space we play in today. And so, Travis, that really brings up exactly the point of why I get so excited when I get to visit with you, because because of the unique space you guys are in, you have, a, and of course, your professional background, you have been able to develop, I think, some really cutting edge solutions. And one of the things I try to do is have your people talk to my people, because your people are, are way down the road on this. I'm going to, I'm fascinating to do, be able to do this with you today, because something recently came out and you're really going to have to educate many of our audience on it. And it's called Rev5. And could you, starting off, could you start off by explaining to our audience what was Rev4 and then what was Rev5 and how do those relate to compliance and other issues for your customer base? Absolutely. Many consider NIST, the National Institutes of Standards and Technology, to be the gold standard for risk and compliance guidance. It's actually the basis for the FISMA law and other things for government-based systems. So on the government side, it's a thou shalt. Private sector side, many of the frameworks like ISO and others sort of derive or loosely use NIST. And so for years, NIST 853 Revision 4 has been the gospel for what you should do to secure systems. It's a high watermark. The government's been using it. There was something called FedRAMP that came out, which basically was a variant of Rev4, which if you were a cloud provider wanting to sell your services to the government, you had to go get compliant at either the low, moderate, or high level, depending on the type of data that you were collecting. So all this was based off NIST 853 Rev4. A while back, NIST put out 853 Rev5 which has been basically adapted and modernized for the current threat environment. So it addresses regulatory change around privacy with what's happened with GDPR and other things are now baked into the NIST guidance, as well as there's a lot more controls around supply chain and third-party risk. So if you look at attacks like solar winds and other things, NIST has recognized the growing threat that attackers are changing what they're doing. And so the security guidance needs to evolve with the attack patterns so that the best practices get put out. And that's what you get in 853 Rev5. Concurrent to that, recently FedRAMP went from Pirates of the Caribbean, where it was guidance, strongly suggested guidance from the government to law. Now thou shalt use FedRAMP. And so if you're a cloud service provider, FedRAMP standing between you and revenue, FedRAMP in May just or just recently announced that they're transitioning to Rev5. 
which comes with more controls, changes to controls. So everybody who went through the expense of Rev4 is now going to have to evolve with NIST and with FedRAMP to Rev5. So it's a big sea change in the cloud community, government contracts, and folks who have compliance programs that are based on NIST. Let me follow up on a couple of things you said in there. First of all, could you tell us what NIST is? Yep, that's the National Institute of Standards and Technology. It's basically a standards body within the federal government that the government turns to when they need to write, it could be safety standards, it could be security standards, wherever they need to develop standards, they're part of the Department of Commerce. And in this case, it's the NIST team that owns and manages all the NIST special publications on cybersecurity that are the Bible for the industry. Um, they are not the obviously the only standards body. You see a lot of ISO internationally. Cloud Security Alliance has some cloud stuff. There are other standards bodies that are developing things, but NIST is essentially the government standards arm that they turn to when they're developing standards for laws, government contracts, and regulations. Does NIST take input from the industry or thought leaders in the industry, such as yourself or others? Oh, absolutely. And uh, if you look at what NIST has done with the OSCAL team, that's the Open Security Controls Assessment Language. They've interacted very closely. They had an open source repo on GitHub. They built communities of interest and continue to expand those. Working with other government agencies, tool providers like ourselves, industry that needs to use those standards. It's been a very collaborative effort. And so you would see like Dr. Iorga, David Waltermeyer, and others that just have been really leaders in a public-private partnership and how they put all this together to solve problems uh, for both sides, not just an ivory tower government approach, but they've been very proactive in reaching out to the community, getting feedback, and iterating in an open source way on some of this. And that's what's always struck me when I'm able to interview someone from your space is much more collaborative, regulatory, or rulemaking aspect than I typically see in other areas of compliance. Does that really allow both uh, the vendors and like yourself in this space but also the, I don't want to say customers, but those vendors to the feds to have a good idea of what's coming down the pike and to be able to prepare for it? Yeah, there's pros and cons in everything. So the pro is the one you hit on. The upside of FedRAMP is you know exactly what the government's expectations are. It's very clearly laid out what you need to do and at what level you need to do it based off the type of data you're going to process for the government. So you get clarity of goal. The OSCAL team is basically working on low-level data standards that make all this information exchange between systems interchangeable. And you can invest in it knowing the government's standing behind it, NIST is standing behind it, it's an international standards body. We all agree we should make better use of data. It should be more interoperable. So having somebody like NIST involved, I think is a great thing. The hard thing is these aren't low watermarks for cybersecurity. So getting to FedRAMP is not a trivial exercise. There's a heavy investment of time, money, and resources to, to hit that standard for the government. So while you get clarity of goal, it's also expensive and time consuming to achieve. And from the government's perspective, as everything moves to the cloud as a function of time, the demand for the government auditors and resources to review those packages and approve them it's hard to sustain as well. And that's why you need automation. You need standards like OSCAL. You need tools like RegScale and others that apply automation and AI and other techniques to this problem space so that government and others can adopt cloud technologies in a secure and compliant manner. I understand difficulty in compliance and I understand difficulty in com complying with updated rules and regulations, but I was struck by a phrase you said, and see if I got it down right, standing between you and revenue. Yep. And there's nothing more motivating than overcoming something that's standing between you and revenue. Would that yep. be a fair assessment? Absolutely. And for a long time, my experience in cybersecurity was it was something that was bolted on at the end. I was a cyber guy. They bring you at the end. Everybody hates you. You tear it apart. You're trying to band-aid something and put the least embarrassing thing into production you could. And 20 years ago, that was state of the art. It's not that way anymore. Every big company we interact with has cybersecurity tools. Cybersecurity is a board level issue. 
Um, but compliance and the regulatory side of that has always been, in my experience, a cost center. You've got to do it, but nobody really likes paying for it. And when it went to staying the way of revenue, it's a, it's a different thing. So now if the only way you can sell to the largest market in the U.S. is to have these things, it's no longer a cost center thing where it's a check the box activity. It's something you need to excel at get done as fast as you can, because it's going to allow you access to bigger markets, larger revenue numbers. You're seeing fundamental shifts and it's not just FedRAMP. CMMC is the same thing on the Department of Defense side where they're flowing down requirements and saying, if you don't do these, you can't do business with the Department of Defense. And you're starting to see other agencies take similar stances as well. So I think what's being recognized is that cyber security is no longer something in the shadows. It's at the forefront of everybody's minds. It's one of the top risks to businesses, whether you're a government agency or you're an industry. This is one of the things that can put you under, embarrass you, cause you legal risk, cause you revenue loss. And so the tides are changing very rapidly. The uh, It struck me that in the anti-corruption world, I came out of the energy industry. And there was a very large amount of enforcement against energy companies in the first decade of this year around anti-corruption. And the business response was to say, if you want to do business with us, you have to have a compliance program and we're going to come look at your program to make sure you have one. And that literally went from $20 billion corporations all the way down to I had a client that had a 15, was a $15 million software company that had one piece of software that did one thing that bolted onto something and they had to have an anti-corruption policy. But what it did was it drove compliance all the way down the chain. And what I just heard you say is the government is driving this down the chain because it's now a requirement to do business. It's not just a good business practice, as you said, having robust cybersecurity. And so this business requirement really seems to resonate. And is that conversation going on with your customers as well? No, absolutely. And so I don't know the energy sector as well, but I came more from the rapid uncontrolled release of energy world, which is more <laughs> related, but it's the same sort of concern. And the reason that they're throwing this into contracts, that they're getting more serious about it in CMC is everybody's getting really tired of seeing our IP show up in other countries where there's just massive IP theft and hacking and other things going on. Um, And they're not doing it against Boeing and Lockheed Martin and the big guys because they've got lots and lots of money to throw at cybersecurity. It's those second, third tier contractors that have a machine shop that have to go work something that have the exact same data, but none of the protections. The government's clued into, you've got to secure the entire supply chain top to bottom that has access to the information because the attackers are going to pick whatever the weakest area is. And it's going to be those second, third tier contractors that just don't have the resources. And so basically what they're saying is if you want to do business with us, you're going to have to invest in cyber at a level where we can feel confident to trust you with our data. And in the past, it was a self-attestation that you just say, hey, I'm going to do this and we'll just trust that you actually are. What they've clued into is a lot of people weren't. So a lot more third-party attestations and uh, trust but verify type approaches that you're seeing versus the just self-attest to it. It's very much changing in many different sectors. The uh, I think another great point you just made was a cyber attack. Most people think of a ransomware attack, but you pointed out correctly that A cyber attack can be for a number of nefarious reasons, including theft of IP. Do, and earlier you brought up solar winds, which was a great example of an attack coming in in a rather unexpected way and theft of some very sensitive information. And do the Boeings of the world, do they now have the clout because of this regulatory framework to tell a Tom Fox machine company? You have to have a NIST certified or a NIST attested cybersecurity program and make that stick. Yeah, the government's looking to work it into law and put it into contracts and be able to cancel your contract for cause if you're not doing these things. It's less the Boeing having the clout and more the government just saying we've had enough. 
if you want our money and we've got a lot of it, you're going to have to meet these standards to do business with us. And so it is going to weed some folks out and may cause some consolidation in the market over time. But I think you're going to, we're going to have to realize we live in a world where supply chain tax are real. Solar winds was the one that, that freaked everybody out. Log4j is another one. If you can get inside of software and contracts that people know and trust and then spread out to many different places from there, it's a very cost-effective way for an attacker to get massive gain. And then the other part, you mentioned ransomware. That's the one just having the benefit of multiple decades doing this now. The, the things like confidentiality was the one we all worried about for years. And so encryption was the big driver. Then we started working, worried about denial of service and ransomware. So then we start worrying about availability. That still leaves open integrity attacks, which are really the scariest ones of all. Those are the things where cyber attacks become physical weapons, where you can trick a PLC or a dam or a reactor into exploding because it can't trust its own inputs. And so there's all sorts, the spectrum of cyber attacks is ever growing. And so what you're seeing is a, an industry and a regulatory framework that's trying to adapt and struggling at times because attackers move a lot faster than regulators can. I wondered if I might be able to turn back to Rev 5 and ask you a few questions specifically tailored to that. And starting off with what are some of the key changes or challenges for cloud services providers under Rev 5? I think you've got a two-parter. One is it costs a lot to develop a Rev 4 package. And whereas The biggest changes are in a couple new control families. So it's just brand new. There's other things that disappear. There's other things that changed. So it's going to be expensive to to go back through that process. And my my guess is the government's not done at Rev 5. There'll be a Rev 6. There'll be a Rev 7. If anything, they want to be able to cycle faster. So you've got to have approaches to how you manage this that are more cost effective than just creating you know, multi-hundred page documents every year or two to attest to these things. It's really in the privacy and supply chain areas where you're going to see the biggest differences between Rev 4 and Rev 5, but there's differences, minor differences across all the control families that are being adapted for today's threat environment. And then how about the same question for third-party assessment organizations? So basically the third-party assessors are just going to take that package and then review it. And so there's a multi-parter. You have to attest that I meet the controls. That's on me to do. And then I've got to provide evidence of that to the third-party assessing organization. So they're going to have to train up on new families, but mostly they're going to have to go back and redo a lot of work. So you're going to see a lot of demand hitting these three PAOs because all the folks that have existing FedRAMP packages have to get to Rev 5 within a certain time frame to keep their certification with the government. So you're going to see a lot of increased demand on the three POs to do this kind of work. And so for them as well, there's not, if you look at any cyber hiring metric in the U.S., there's not a surplus of these folks that are just sitting around, right? So creating huge demand signals with no ability to ramp up people forces you into automation is really the only solution to that problem. The You've almost answered this question three or four times during this podcast, but I'm going to either ask it again or ask you to maybe uh, tie it all together in answering this following question. Looking down the road, and I'm going to say 2030 and beyond, you've already said you expect additional regulatory requirements from the government, Rev 6, 7, and 8 even perhaps. Are there already discussions based upon either some of the ongoing attacks that we've seen or where they think the government thinks the Chinese or other state actor groups may go and will increase this need for automation? Yeah, I think you're always going to see the need to revise the standards. Some of it you may get from our intel community and others who are watching what attackers are doing, the threats that are changing, and then adapting our defense posture and standards to better protect organizations in a constantly changing threat environment. So you'll always get that push. You're also always going to get a push from industry around affordability. 
as this stuff flows down, there's only so much money people have to put into this before things start becoming unaffordable. So you're getting a lot of cost pushback in different areas from industry. So there's always this tuning between cost and risk. Where's the risk really at? What's it costing to mitigate it? And is that equation balancing properly? So you'll see industry in particular pushing a lot there. And so I think those two things to the end of time are always going to force the need to constantly be continuously improving our standards to a, to adapt. So we want them to be more cost effective. We want them to be more attuned to changing threats and risk. And then you try to balance that by adding automation at a pace where costs don't just balloon out of control as you're constantly having to change and adapt. So, Travis, unfortunately, we are near the end of our time for this episode. But before we leave, I wanted to ask you if our listeners wanted any more information on yourself, on Reg Scale, perhaps Rev 5, what would be the best place or places for them to go? Yeah, I think you can go to the FedRAMP website. The upside is they have a ton of resources there. They've also got a lot of GitHub resources that have examples of OSCAL artifacts. You can um, you can learn you can lose days diving into that stuff and trying to learn about it. If you want to learn more about what we do, go to regscale.com, check out our website. There's some forums there. You can reach out to us. You just want to geek out and have a conversation about some of this stuff. You want to learn about how you should think about automation and what's working and not working with GRC tools today. We'd love to have those conversations and see where we could help or add value. And then the NIST OSCAL website as well. I always encourage people to watch what they do. I'm a fanboy of that team. There's not really an answer to this problem unless we take a standards-based approach with automation. That's the only way we're going to be able to move the industry forward in a good way. And so I've watched anything where Dr. Dr. Iorga is talking or the NIST OSCAL team, I'd highly encourage people to, to tune into that and, the, and some of the thought leadership that they're putting out. Travis, I always enjoy visiting with you and I enjoyed it again. And I hope we can continue this conversation. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity to be here.